Well, hello everyone. I want to spend some time talking about this next uh, uh, concept. It's actually quite elaborate. It is a five-step process known as the consumer decision-making model. And uh, to break it down into a good discussion, I'm only going to talk about the first two steps. Uh, and then in another video, I'll go ahead and move into the next one. But this basically explains those steps that we take in making any kind of decision, be it a small one or a big one, things like that, as far as making a purchase and, and things of that sort. So let's go ahead and get started. One of the very first stages of the consumer decision-making model is what we call problem recognition. And simply put, the, the consumer turns around and, in essence, believes there's a problem. And, and I do use the word perceives here, okay, that a problem exists. Um, because sometimes the problem is very real, all right? We've lost weight and we need new clothes. Uh, we're taking college classes and we need books. You know, we're out of gas and we need more gas, okay, to make our, our vehicle go, that kind of thing. You know, it's a very real problem. But sometimes problems uh, can be perceived, all right, or we want to get things towards our ideal state. Um, we've lost weight, we can fit into our old clothes but we feel we really need some new clothes, all right? You know, maybe our car is working, but we feel we, we need a new one, all right? A new used one, a new, new one, whatever the case may be. So really the very first step in stage one is, is recognizing that there is a problem, all right? And a lot of companies work at trying convincing you that there, you have a problem and therefore they have a product to, to resolve it. That actually happens a lot. Stage two, now that you convince convinced yourself there's a problem, consumers have to look for information so they can make a good purchasing decision, all right? It's time to gather up the information. Now, when it comes to doing these searches, there are different types of searches, okay? There's actually what is called a pre-purchase search, and this is when we typically need information to make a purchase, all right? We don't know something about a given product, so we got to go out and gather stuff. But then there's what we sometimes refer to as an ongoing search, where a pre-purchase search is more of learning uh, information before making a purchase. An ongoing search is occurs when we are uh, when we're browsing, okay? When we gather information for a possible future purchase. If I get around to it, I may someday buy one of these, I don't know. Um, so, you know, I'm here, I'm looking, that's about it. That's what we call an ongoing search, all right? So there really are two different types. Um, companies love it much more when you are going through a pre-purchase search than an ongoing search. Because an ongoing search, with gathering the information, you may find lots of things you like, but that doesn't mean you're gonna buy. So, you know, pre-purchase is their preference, but they accept the fact that sometimes you're going to have an ongoing search, okay? You go searching, you go looking at cars in a parking lot, in a car lot. You know, they want you to be pre-purchase in mindset. You may be going just to look. That's ongoing, okay? There are different types of information sources worth noting here, all right, where you get your information. Um, you can get information that you've stored in your own memory. It's what we call an internal source, all right? Uh, basically, this is stuff you just, you think to yourself, what you've seen before or what you've learned before. Now, some stuff that you're pulling from memory, all right, it comes from what uh, we call directed learning. This is where it's gained. Um, directed learning simply means you consider information from a previous search. You consider information from a previous search, all right? And so you're thinking of making a purchase. Uh, you remember the last time you looked, you saw this or you saw that. You liked this, but you didn't like that. And so that's very directed learning. You, you searched before, and now you're applying that information. There's also what's called an incidental learning, okay? Incidental learning occurs when we're exposed um, to a product that at the time we were not considering buying, okay? You know, if you ever say to yourself, I remember once seeing an ad for, and then you fill in the spot, that's an example of an incidental search. You weren't thinking about it at the time, you weren't considering it, but 
you know, here we are, and, and, and so, you know, now you're using that information. But, but internal sources is information from you, information that you got from a prior search, or information that you sort of stumbled upon, okay? And then there are what we call external sources. External sources is sort of the, the process of gathering information. How can I say this? Process of analyzing information that has been given to us by others, okay, outside sources. It could be ads that we've seen on television. It could be comments made by a friend. It could be reviews that you saw on the Internet. Uh, I think a lot of times TripAdvisor is a good example. If you're going to go travel, going to stay in a certain place, do a certain uh, 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 trip, you know, uh, you rely on an external source. That's a <clears throat> that's a very good example, that kind of stuff. So that's part of the uh, part of the information source. Sometimes it comes from within, sometimes it comes outside of you. We speak of the art of gathering information. Okay, for some people they really love this. Okay, there is something out there we call the EOI, the Economics of Information Approach. How do we go about gathering information before making a purchase? Okay, now ideally we gather as much information as possible, okay, prior to making a purchase. We learn everything we can so that we can make the smartest purchase we can possibly make, you know, financially, uh, economically, functionally, you know, to be practical and so on. Ideally, that's what we do. In reality, that ain't the case, okay? It, it, it's not. Most people do not turn around and, and do this, this approach. In fact, if you start to uh, uh, look at this as in terms of income, lower income people, middle income families, upper income families, and stuff like that, um, and you ask yourself, you know, who tends to turn around and, and gathers the least amount of information before purchasing, lower class, middle class, or upper class? And you might be surprised to find out, all right, it's the lower class. And the worst part is they have the most to lose by making a bad purchase. I'm not picking on people. It's what our research tells us. Uh, lower income people, uh, though they have the most to lose, they tend to do the least amount of searching when it comes to gathering information. And, and obviously, uh, it hurts them. A lot of it is overconfidence. You know, uh, we feel we, we know enough information, so we don't do the search or we don't put in the time to do it and stuff like that. Okay, economics of information. It's the ideal way, but it's not really the way we use a lot. Some of the determinants of an information search that influence this, okay, include what I would call, well, let me put it this way, uh, the activity of a search, all right, for a product, the amount of effort that goes into it, the amount of work that goes into it, increases, okay, usually becomes greater, doesn't mean everyone does it, depending upon how important the purchase is. All right? If you want to buy a new stereo, if you want to buy a car, if you want to buy something um, that is very important to you, uh, you put more time into it. Okay? Um, when we want to learn more about the product is another thing that can influence it. If we truly want to gather more information and find out what it is and how it works and what it's all about, if that matters to us, we'll put more time into it and, and definitely use that to our advantage. And we also love to search when it's very easily obtainable, the information is, okay? Uh, today with the internet, a lot of times you can go online and look up information about quite a few products some websites will set you up with the ability to compare products and, and that makes it very easily obtainable and so people will turn around and do that so um, you know the, the internet has made a big big difference in, in that regard so these are three things that determine how much effort you put into it how important it is to you um, if you really want to learn about it or not or how hard is it to gather the information so who searches for information the most okay when it comes to uh, things like this this is a nice little model and if you take a look this model is in the book okay who searches for uh, information the most you will notice there if you start in the bottom left hand corner where it's uh, where the uh, 
inverse line is uh, starting in the bottom left hand corner. Imagine that means the amount of uh, knowledge is low, so the searching isn't very much. As the product knowledge increases, searching increases. Okay, You climb up the arch, you climb up that. But notice if you get to the point that you know too much about a product, all right, so you're getting way to the far right end of that uh, curve, the amount of searching actually goes back down. So this is very fascinating. When it comes for searching for information, all right, in terms of product knowledge, uh, the least we know, the more we search, up to a point. If we get to a point that we know an awful lot about a product, we don't search much anymore. And it really shows in how we, uh, we make our purchases. Okay, So be aware of that. It's sort of a curvy linear effect. So as product knowledge increases, searching increases, but only up to a point. Because after a while, if we know too much, we just don't search it out. Now what about the risk? What about the risk? The more we search and gather information, the bigger risk we may take when we make a purchase. Okay, So risk can be a very, very big part of this. It really can have an influence upon this. Um, in terms of risk, there are some different characteristics to keep in mind. All right, uh, Characteristics of perceived risk. Uh, if it's expensive, if it's complex, is it hard to understand product? Then, then it's a risky purchase. That influences risk. Um, because it's going to cost us a lot of money. It's very hard to put together. Uh, I don't understand all it does. That's Those are risk elements. Um, a product choice is uh, potentially embarrassing. Okay, That's a perceived risk. If I make a poor purchase, and uh, I can I can really humiliate myself for doing so. If you go to the store, uh, you go shopping for clothes, and you buy a particular uh, pair of pants or shirt or something, and uh, people look at you and wonder, okay, what were you thinking when you purchased that? And maybe your best friend will pulls you aside and tells you, what were you thinking? All right, um, you know, you can embarrass yourself. So that's another element of risk that comes into play. I mean, some risks can be downright very real, right? You make a purchase of something, uh, physical danger. You see somebody thinking of buying a, uh, a motorcycle, okay? If you don't know a lot about them and you, you haven't learned how to ride one well and you get one of these bikes that is extremely fast, the term we used to use is crotch rocket. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. That's what a lot of people call it. I mean, it's physically dangerous, all right? Versus some risks are more subjective, which is the, the embarrassment element. Okay, so these are some of the characteristics of perceived risk that you know based on cost, based on difficulty, based on embarrassment. There is a chart in your chapter that talks about the five different types of risk, and you will see it here. Okay, monetary risk. All right. The buyers that are most sensitive to this, I, I can read this chart to you. You know, risk capital consists of money and property. Those with very little income, uh, very little in terms of wealth, are very vulnerable. And purchases both subject to risks here are your high ticket items. All right. Functional risk, uh, your money uh, risk capital consists of uh, alternate means of performing the function or meeting the need. Uh, practical consumers are are the most sensitive to this. Um, any kind of product or service whose purchase and use requires the buyer's exclusive commitment are very sensitive. And, I, and, and I'll let you look at these. Physical risk, social risk, psychological risk, okay, and so on. These are the five different types of risk, and they really do come into play. So, all right, that's enough for now. Hope that helps. That's sort of the first two chapter or first two uh, segments of the decision-making model. We'll talk about the others here in an uh, upcoming video. Take care.